Jackie Miller, host of Out of Crazy Town, your guide to divorcing a narcissist. Many of you may be trapped in a marriage or relationship where you know something is wrong and things will not get better. Divorce is daunting, especially when you suspect the person you may divorce will become a monster once the process begins. I have Kate Anthony on the show today. She is the host of her own podcast, The Divorce Survival Guide, and she has created a program called Should I Stay or Should I Go to help women in this difficult situation. Kate talks with us about how to navigate this decision and come to a conclusion that is best for you and your family. You can find out more about Kate at kateanthony.com. Hello, Kate Anthony. Thank you so much for being on Out of Crazy Town, your guide to divorcing a narcissist. I'm super excited to have you today. Thank you so much, Jackie. I'm happy to be here. All right. So it's great to have a fellow coach and fellow podcaster on. You know, we're in this world of divorce, and even <laughs> though we may have like slightly different niches. Is, there's so much to talk about, <laughs> especially with somebody else who's maybe feeling your pain on, on so many levels. So I really appreciate you coming on because you have so many cool programs that, and coaching programs um, mm -hmm. that you do. And I, I yeah. just, I want you to go into all those and explain all those to us awesome. today. But specifically, we're going to get into, should I stay or should I go? Which I love because yes, of course, a lot of people I'm sure find you or I because they're in the midst of the divorce, but I know I spent years, years. wondering if years. I should stay or should go. <laughs> years. Yeah. And I saw that you spent years wondering mm -hmm. if you should stay or you should go. So I just wanted to kind of tell everybody a little bit more. <laughs> you probably found Kate before you found me, but she uh, has the Divorce Survival Guide podcast and is the creator of the groundbreaking online coaching program, Should I Stay or Should I Go?, which helps women make the most difficult decision of their lives using coaching tools, relationship education, geeky neuroscience, which I love. I'm a total geeky neuroscience person. I think <laughs> It, it helps explain a lot, at least for it me. It does. Yes. It does. Yes. It does. So feel yep. free to get mm -hmm. into as much geeky neuroscience as you want. Um, and then community support and deep self-work. So thanks again for being on oh, today. Thank you so much for having me. So, I, you know, I was reading uh, the little blurb on your website that talks about how you were in a toxic marriage and you tried to basically bend yourself into different shapes of pretzel to get through this and be the better person and work harder, work harder, work harder. And it didn't work. No. <laughs> Turns out I wasn't really the problem. Interesting. Um, I mean, listen, it's not that I have no responsibility. Of course. Um, in the relationship and how it how it worked and how it turned out and all of that stuff. Because of course, we all have our parts in things. And that being said, you know, when you're in an abusive marriage, you're not the problem. And no matter what you do, you will never solve the problem. I was going to couples therapy with my ex-husband um, in order to fix the problems, right? I was there sort of with good will and good intentions to work towards solution. Yes. And a narcissist, as he, he was diagnosed <laughs> by a therapist, a narcissist and an abuser in particular, they actually work towards conflict. Right. Right. They, they like the conflict. And so you're basically in therapy at cross purposes, which is why you never go to therapy with an abuser. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are a variety of other reasons, but really when you're when you're working at cross purposes, you cannot solve the problem. They're not there to solve the problem. No. They are there to continue to abuse you and manipulate you so that they can continue to abuse you. There's yeah. just so much that goes on and, and it's so conflicting. So you'll start to tell one story and then you'll think, I have to tell the backstory to explain that story. But then there's a backstory to that backstory because they're constantly manipulating and they need That's right. the That's waters right. muddied. Hence. And what's really interesting, and I and I'm sure you find this too, Jackie, which is that like, you know, when your clients are telling you this, like they don't actually most of the time don't understand the entire world of this of the issue. And yeah. so, but when you're telling someone like us, I'm sort of like, oh yeah, I get it. I get it. I get it. You don't actually have to go into all that backstory because, you know, and then I'm able to say, this is actually what's happening. And they're like, oh my God, someone yeah. finally understands. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I know that is, e even though they come to us maybe for, or 
for specific reasons at the time, you're absolutely right. The big overall arching sort of umbrella to what we do is that we just get it. And Mm -hmm. until you've been through it, Mm -hmm. you don't get it. You don't get it. You You can't. Because it's so psychologically manipulating. It's so the gaslighting (laughs) number one tool that they use is gaslighting. And so the design of gaslighting is to make you question your reality. Yep. And so if you're confused, then they've won. They've, they're doing their job. They're doing a great job of it. And and we get it. And we, we get, get it. it. And it's like you said, it's why therapy won't work. And, and this really obviously speaks to the heart of this topic today. Should I stay or should I go? Because mm-hmm. if you're listening to this and you're interested in this topic, you are in therapy. You have been in therapy. You're wondering oh, why you- it's not working. Yeah. And I want to say that it can be very difficult for women to hear that, right? If yeah. they say, if we, when we say Therapy isn't going to work. And not only is therapy not going to work, it is putting you in more danger. It's an it's a tool that abusers use to abuse. And so when we say that, what I think the listener is experiencing is, well, if therapy's not going to work, what do I do? And unfortunately, what we're saying is what you're experiencing isn't going to change. They are not going to stop abusing you. They don't want to, and they can't. They can't. They can't. I had a conversation with my ex-husband recently, and we're good friends, um, you know, miraculously. And we sort of, I don't know how the conversation happened. I think it was because his second marriage fell apart for many of the same reasons, but in a much more catastrophic way. Interesting. Um, because, you know, internet, texting, like when I got divorced, it was 2008, eight nine. like nothing was, we didn't have this stuff, right? Okay. And so- or it was new. It's not a paper trail anymore. There's a digital trail <laughs> that yeah. we didn't have, right? No, Hidden. it changes anyway, the game. It changes the game for it sure. It changes yeah. the game. But so I had this conversation with my ex-husband recently and he was crying and he said, Kate, I just wish that you understood that all of the work I was doing, I was, you know, all of my therapy when we were married, all of my therapy and all of my 12-step work was, I was trying to figure out, he said, I, I wish you knew how much I loved you, which was, by the way, completely news to me. Mm. Like, completely news to me. 25 years later, I was like, what? You what? what? The day we met, I never felt that he loved me. He said, I wish I... Now, that's because he's not really capable and all of those things. Right. But he said, I wish... In his mind, he's like, I loved you so much. And all of the work I was doing, I was trying to figure out how to do this and how to be a, a good husband and how how to not feel all the things I was feeling and 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 do all the things I was doing. I was really trying. And that was such a like groundbreaking admission. You know, it didn't work. Wow. The bottom but the bottom line is this is a man who was actually desperately trying. Wow. A- according to him. Yeah. But it didn't work. Right. And so most are not desperately trying. They're not in this relationship to love you. They're in the relationship to control you. So, I would say controls their oxygen. They cannot give it up. It's the only thing they know. It's the only way they right. know how to survive. They mm-hmm. they cannot stop the control aspect, which obviously comes out in so many different kinds and forms of abuse. And the other interesting thing I found about marriage counseling, couples counseling with my ex is that it can be very scary if you also get the wrong therapist. Like I'm like you, I luckily- I luckily yep. had one that was like, um, I need to speak to Jackie alone he left. And she handed me a book and had all the narcissistic uh, personality disorder check boxes. And she goes, how many of these do you think he checks? And I'm like, all of them. And she said, uh-huh. Yeah, Look what, right. read, yeah. read the title. And I was like, uh-huh. And do you know, back then when I was trying to bend myself in a pretzel, like you, yeah. I was mm-hmm. actually kind of offended by her presentation. Wow. Interesting. Like, like what? You're not going to help us? No. So it's very rare. They're they're dealing with communication. They're dealing with right, like all of these things and abuse. And it's not a communication issue, and it's not a relationship problem. Right. It's an abuser problem. And so, and I think you know, I sort of started on this tangent um, <laughs> because I really just want to acknowledge how hard that, like you just said, she handed you this book, and you were like, "So what? You're so what's the solution? So how are you yeah. going to help us? How are you going to fix it?" Exactly. Right. And so that, and so to hear someone say, oh, honey, I'm so sorry. This, this can't be fixed. Right. Is devastating. Yes. Yes. Devastating. It's a huge pill to swallow. And it is so hard for us to grasp because we're empaths and this doesn't make sense in our brains. Right. 
We just try this harder. Art, this doesn't compute. No. Right? Like, because we think everyone's like us. They're not. And that's what's so hard. That's what's so hard. And so this, we're already sort of leading into this then. So what are some of the other reasons you see women stay? So like in my example of mine, oh, yeah. ignorance, kind of, you know, pretty much, I guess, for the lack of a better word, ignorance. But yeah. what are some of the other reasons you see them stay? Well, we love this person. We love the person that they pretended to be in the beginning. We love the person we think they, we think what they are. Like we, we sort of see the, you know, I call it the gold, the golden nugget and the pile of shit. Yeah. Like we know that deep down, they're a really great person. If they would just heal their trauma, if they, if we could just love them enough, right? All of that stuff, because look, narcissism is born of a trauma. Sure. Narcissists are created. And so our minds, we think, well, there's a trauma there that needs to be addressed. And if I can just love them enough, everything will be okay. Yes. And we believe their promises. And we believe the fact that like my ex-husband said, like he loved me so much. He just wanted to he wanted to he wanted to love me too right and i believed that for yeah. so many years right yeah and so we don't want the relationship to end we want the abuse to stop and we want the person that we fell in love with yeah and why is that so fucking hard right <laughs> right? right right and so that's i mean honestly i think it all boils down to that's why we stay absolutely we no, also go, stay no, because we're financially disempowered because women are you know, overwhelmingly financially disempowered in marriages because we buy into the fairy tale and become stay-at-home moms. We give over all our power. And listen, financial abuse is a very uh, common form of abuse that goes hand in hand with other forms of emotional abuse or psychological abuse, yes. all of those things, right? Yes. It is, you know, I think there's a statistic that is something like, you know, 90% of women who are being abused are also being financially abused. It's yes. a very high statistic. Um, yes. And and don't quote me on that actual 90%, but it's something, it is something like that. So it's hard for us to leave. Yeah. It, it's it's literally hard for us to leave because you can't afford to leave. And it's you read my mind. That's exactly mm -hmm. where I was headed next was with the financial abuse. And it has to be somewhere in the 90s. And also and, you've got the gender wage gap, right? So, yeah, you yeah. know, it's like, well, who who does it make more sense to stay home? The higher income earner or the lower income earner? Even if it's right. like close, right? Yeah. And with exorbitant costs of childcare. There's just tons of reasons that we end up making these choices that completely disempower us yeah. and hamstring us when it comes down to it. Right. So it's really financial abuse. Are, we're all set up in society. It's all teed up for them to use financial yes. abuse. It's too easy. It's like yep. shooting fish in a barrel. It's too easy to use financial abuse to keep you. So I found those statistics, by the way. Oh, so, awesome. Huh, these are these are harsh. Financial abuse occurs in 99% oh, okay. of domestic violence cases. And this is taken from um, a study called Measuring the Effects of Domestic Violence on Women's Financial Wellbeing, which was done at Michigan State. And victims of financial abuse collectively lose a total of 8 million days of paid work each year. That's collective, obviously. 59% of people's credit is negatively uh, impacted by their abuser, and 70% of domestic violence victims are forbidden to work yes. by their abusers. Yep. That's yep. like 99. I was worried I was overstating it at 90. Nope, no. it's 99. No. And you know, statisticians hate to put 100 on anything because it's like, you know, it, <laughs> there's it, always you know, an exception. Yes, that's there's right. always an exception. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. basically 100% of the time. Now we're kind of going back to the very beginning when we said like, um, you, you know, yes, if you're in a marriage where there's abuse, probably not going to work out if you keep just keep trying, 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 trying. And yes. therapy isn't going to work and you can't bend yourself in the right pretzel shape. It, there is no such thing. You can't try hard enough. There is, you know, no such thing. It's designed that you can never catch up. I always used to say That's I was right. always in trouble for something. Oh my I could God. never always, catch up. I could always. never get enough points to be out of the system. Yes. Well, it's a moving target, right? Yeah. So they tell you if you'll just do X, everything will be fine. So then you put all your energy into doing X because everything's going to be fine. And then you achieve X and they're like, yeah, but you know, there's Y yeah. and Y, no, you just, you didn't quite do X right. Even though I gave you specific directions and you 
follow the specific directions. I mean, it, and it goes on forever and you're like, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do, what? but I'm not doing it right. I'm not doing it right. I'm not doing it right. And that's where the pretzels come in. Ugh, right, it's right. so exhausting. So for any of you out there listening, and this is all sounding way too familiar, unfortunately, mm -hmm. um, you know, like Kate and I said, we 100% get what's going on and we understand all of it. Um, hopefully you're not too discouraged that it's not going to work. <laughs> you can't bend yourself in the right pretzel shape. But Kate, so you designed a program called Should I Stay yes, or Should I Go? I and sure so what was your, what's your strategy here for, for approaching this problem? If you're that person listening right now and you're like, ugh. Yeah. So the very first thing, because the design of the abuser is to whittle away at your self-esteem so that you just have nothing left. If you feel like an empty shell of yourself, that's what I felt like. That's what Jackie felt like. And if you're listening to us now, right, however many years on we both are from our divorces, it's because we did a lot of fucking work yeah. to reclaim our sense of self and our, you know, our personal power and our self-esteem. Yeah. But we did not start this way. Like if you're listening to us, and you're like, these girls, you know, they're kick ass and they're confident and that, yeah, we are, but oh my God, how long did it take us to rebuild that? Oh my God. Like, <laughs> right? you know, when I was in, in the dredges, the depths of despair, I looked for people who had made it to the other side to just know it's possible. Yeah. But sometimes I would doubt myself, like there must be something special about them though. There must That's be right. something. That's right. They, they're, they're a little more outgoing than me. They weren't, you know, maybe their marriage wasn't quite as toxic as mine. They're, they had some special skills before they even got this marriage that I don't possess. No. That's right. Nope. It, nope. No. No. And so the very first thing that we do in my program is the self work, right? Because what the design of the of, a, of abuse is, is to keep the focus off of yourself and onto them, right? If you're trying to, if you're constantly chasing a moving target and you can never catch up, it's your focus has to be on the other person, right? Yeah. And yes. that's how we lose ourselves. So the very first thing we do is the building up of self. And that in itself can be so powerful, right? Connecting to your intuition. As women, we have a finely tuned sense of intuition. And it's actually easier than we think to mm -hmm. reconnect to it and to reclaim it because it's pretty primal in women. Yes, it is. Um, for a variety of reasons, a lot of scientific data to back that up. And so, you know, we quiet the noise and we simply focus on who are you? And there are building blocks to self-esteem. And one of the first is self-knowledge, right? Mm. I didn't know who the fuck I was when I was in my marriage. I had lost myself so much. I had no idea who I was. I couldn't tell you what my favorite color is. I just, you know, people would say, how are you? And I'd be like, good, yeah. uh, fine. And they'd be like, that's oh, not a feeling. Like, how, how are you feeling? And I couldn't, I could not. I, 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 I describe myself as a head on legs, yep. right? Anything that was in my core center of my being was just, I was completely disconnected from. And so we start by, by building those little blocks. Like what matters to you? Who are you? And you know, what are your values? And the values work that I do in my program is very different from like your corporate, you know, pick it off of a list, right? Like, no, right. right. This is who you are. And so so many women, they get to the values part and they're like, our values don't align at all. Yeah. Right? I tell this story because I think it's hilarious. I have a client years ago. One of her top values, as we mined for values, was around personal development. Obviously, she was working with me. She was working with a coach. She had a therapist. She'd read all the books. She'd read all the podcasts, right? Personal development and growth was one of her top values. And I asked her if, you know, if this aligned with her husband and she, and she burst out laughing and she was like, are you kidding? She said his response to me every time I say like something about growth is like, you know who I was when you married me. I haven't changed in 20 years. <laughs> and I was like, look, I'm taking all the judgment out of it. Yeah. All the judgment right. out of it. Right. Is that an alignment? Right. And so that can be really clarifying. Yes. Um, you know, over the last, God, how many years has it been? Seven, eight years, right? That has come to the, that has risen to the surface in a lot of marriages. You know, I have clients who are like, we're Christian and I believe that like Jesus was inclusive and loved everybody. And we're going to this church that's spewing hate. And my husband's on board with this. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, those are your values, right? Yeah. So now how do you reconcile that? And just, it becomes, starts to become very clear. Right. <laughs> right. 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 
So the self-work is the first part. The second part is really about understanding abuse, toxicity, cycles of abuse, various kinds of abuse, if that's happening, right? It's, it may right. not be happening. Unfortunately, I see this more often than not. I was going to say the chances are. You know, and I and I do a whole lot of work, you know, toxic masculinity and male entitlement. I, I am not here to bash men. There is a system that we exist in. It's unequal. It thrives on the oppression of women for the sake of the advancement of men. So we live in a culture right now that creates and perpetuates narcissistic tendencies and abusers in sure males. Sure does. Sure does. Absolutely. I hate it, but that's, yeah. just a, that's just a fact, right? Yeah. And I, yeah, I say this a lot on this podcast, like I don't hate men at all. And I, I actually am in a great relationship and there's wonderful men and I have wonderful friends with wonderful husbands. And, you know, so there are many that's examples. Right. That's right. Yep. Um, however, I, I love everything that you said, namely about trusting your intuition, because you've had to push that down for so long. If you're in this so kind long. of relationship, you had to deny it especially during the gaslighting. I have an episode coming out with a psychiatrist where we really got into gaslighting. And that's one of the things it does is it you are trained to stop listening to your instincts. And so reconnecting with that, Kate, sounds amazing. And having a yeah. program um, to go through with you sounds amazing because it's it's one of the most basic things. And and gosh, one of my first episodes I had on um, someone who came on anonymously, and she's a woman I know who's extremely successful in her field. And she talked about being at the store and she couldn't decide like what color towels to get in the bathroom. And she had to call and text her husband and ask mm -hmm. him which hand color hand towels in the guest bathroom she should get. She couldn't make any decisions for herself. She'd been in this doubt herself, no confidence relationship and marriage for so long. And I'm like, yeah. you couldn't decide what color towels did she said? No, I couldn't. I couldn't That's make right. that decision for myself. I did not trust myself. I was afraid I was going to get in trouble when I got home. If I got the wrong ones, I was going to, you know, for all the reasons. But so, yeah, so reconnecting with that is so important it's because it's so, it's so important. It's so important. And it's really hard. It's really hard. I'm not going to like sugarcoat it, but I do have meditations and, you know, guided mm. meditations and visualizations that really help with it, Yeah, you know, and then immediately the critics come in and they try to override it, right? So the program really deals with like, okay, how do we do this battle <laughs> yeah. between the two? And really part of it is identifying the two voices, right? Because they're in constant conflict with each other. Yep. And at a certain point, you have to, you've got to be able to discern which is which. And so, so those are the first two parts. And the third one is really about like interpersonal communication and actually what the, what the fuck is a healthy relationship? What does it look like? Yes. What does it feel like? Right. I love that. Because I always say, let's talk about what good looks like. Yes. Yes. And what does it feel like? How does it feel to be in a healthy relationship? Because yeah. most of us don't know. No. You know, if you're really looking hard at yourself and like you said, you know, if you were in an abusive relationship. No, it's not your fault. You were abused. Abusers abuse and they're going to go on and abuse the next person. And so, you know, you didn't cause the abuse, so to speak. However, we do have our green flags, right? We had our personality to traits that developed, however, from whatever, from our own personal trauma or whatnot that did make us mm -hmm. targets That's for right. these people. And so you're right. You have to take a hard look at those, I'm yeah. assuming. And, yes. And that had us conflate the feelings that we were having in this relationship in the beginning stages with love. And that's, that. you know, I know a lot of people that, that are like, if you're the victim of abuse, you have zero responsibility and like, it's not your fault. And like, I agree with that. It's not your fault. And if I had been a healthier person when I met my ex-husband, I would have walked away the very first time we left a party and he told me everything I did wrong and all the ways I was an embarrassment to him and all the ways, you know, I made him uncomfortable. I would have seen that as a red flag as opposed to, oh, let me change myself the next time we're at a party to be better and different so he'll love me. I would have seen that as you are trying to get your uh, self-esteem and your identity off of me. And if I do something wrong, you see it as a reflection of yourself because you're a narcissist. Yeah. And I would have walked away. I would have yep. said, that's not love and walked away. 
And so I was primed, yes, to be a target, but also to think that that was love. Right. Based on my history. And we have to take responsibility for that. And it's not that that makes it our fault. Right. But my God, it gives us power to be able to look at that stuff and heal it so that we can recognize it the next time and not, right? It's like, if we have no responsibility and it's just them, right. then like we should probably join a convent and <laughs> never right. look at them again, right? Because what you're saying is you have zero control over zero any control. of it and you're going to mm -hmm. go out in the world and you might be a target again. Well, that's terrifying. So no, you do have control, which is the good news. Right. You can look at the situation. You can look at yourself and you can, right. I love what you said about values too, because if you think about it, I also sort of put values in the category of all those times that my intuition was trying to tell me like, this isn't right. This isn't good. And it's yeah. because his values were not aligning with mine or he was trampling all over them. Things he thought were funny that were like gross or, or, or horrible things or, and he would yeah. laugh his ass off. And I would think right. that is so disturbing. How can you laugh? at that, whatever the situation was. Mm -hmm. And I would literally feel sick to my stomach. And it was, you know, my intuition, my body saying, this is so against your values. It, you know, that's, it's disrespectful or whatever is happening. And, and he thinks it's funny. Like right. that is a huge clash in values right. there. And so, 100%. yeah, I, I, I love what you're saying about thinking about what your values really are. And then mm -hmm. also in listening to your instincts and getting back in tune with your intuition. Yeah, right. Personal responsibility isn't blame, it's power. Yeah. It gives you power to, it gives you, it's a guidepost about where you need to heal. Absolutely. Because again, we, we can give that guy's name, Bob or Jim or whatever. It doesn't matter. You know, it's just, mm -hmm. there'll be another wolf in sheep's clothing. It doesn't matter. So again, it has to sort of all rest with you at the end and, and you take the power back. And That's right. And this control. is why the divorce rate is worse for second and third marriages, by the way. Ah, if going to just, explain that. Well, so the divorce rate, you know, I don't, I don't know what the stats are right now, but historically they've been around 50%, right? Sure. Second, the divorce rate for second marriages is 68%. And the divorce rate for third marriages is around 74%. Mm. So this is because I assert that this is because we are saying, well, it wasn't me, it was him. <laughs> right? So I'm not doing the work to heal what happened the first time. I'm just choosing somebody who looks a little bit different on the outside. But if I'm using the same picker, yeah. they're the same person on the inside, yeah. right? Or similar. I also think that divorce rates are higher for second and third marriages because you know, overwhelmingly these days, women are not remarrying because we're starting to really come to terms with the fact that marriage does not serve women. It serves men um, on the backs of women's labor. And we're not necessarily willing to sign up for that again. But men are remarrying it, they almost immediately because they can't, they realize that they can't function without us, without our labor, without our yes! support, right? Yes. So they get divorced. They, they get remarried right away. And then oh, they yes, marry they someone do. younger. And then as that person grows, they're like, um, wait a minute. <laughs> oh, hold on a minute. Right? Yep. So yeah, it's something like 65% of divorced women are like, I'm good. <laughs> yep. Yep. Don't need that. Don't, like you said, it, and I love because you say on your website, like marriages are super awesome for men, you know, and, and we're super figuring awesome that out. Men. Yeah. Yep. yep. Super awesome. Not so much for us. No, no, no. It's, it's, <laughs> I saw the funniest, like, like TikTok or Instagram yesterday too, where the guy says, we have a magic coffee table. And the wife says, what are you talking about? And he goes, it doesn't matter what I put on this coffee table. I could leave my dishes. I could leave garbage. I could whatever. I wake up in the morning and it's gone. Like we have a magic coffee table. And she, magic. Looks at she, she goes, you're, you're kidding, right? And he's like, no, it's crazy. And then we also have a magic laundry basket. No matter how much laundry you put in it, when you get up the next day, it's gone and it's all folded and sitting on your bed. I'm like, yeah, marriage is super awesome for you, isn't it? And God But it's true. Us. And then we still go to work and we still raise the kids. And it is, it's bizarre uh -huh. yeah. how none, in most cases, in most cases, some it's different, that shift of power does not change at home even when we go to work. Oh, no, it doesn't. Oh, no, it absolutely doesn't. Shift of um, responsibility, I should say, doesn't Yes, change. yes, um, yes. Most women who work outside the home are also responsible for almost all of the domestic labor as well, right? So they yeah. call this the second shift, right? We've got one shift that we do at, at our job and then we come home and we got to do all of the other stuff while 
Men, I think they have, it's something like they have 35% more leisure time. Mm. Working men have like 35% more leisure time than working women. Like they come home and they're like, whew, I worked. It's time to like put my feet up and like watch the game. I'm tired. And women come home from work and they're like, okay, I guess it's time to, you know, make dinner and go grocery shopping and give the kids a bath. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So in that scenario, with that description, you're right. The husband being gone, so now there's the divorce. Why would you add that back? <laughs> Literally, why would you add that back? I'm why telling you, you right now that even even being responsible for a hundred percent of the work in your home, being single, right, yeah. is preferable to being responsible for a hundred percent of the work, like also their mess and their shit and all of that. But also the nagging irritation and anger that's constant resentment that's building up every single day, right? That's exhausting. Good point. It's exhausting to be resentful all the time. Um, You know, and even, by the way, a lot of these statistics are also in marriages where the Pew Research did a study in, I think, 2015 where they they actually addressed marriages in which like they purport to be very happy marriages and the men are like no the domestic labor is like it's totally 50 50. i do a lot in the house and the women were like "Uh (laughs) uh-huh and so they studied them right because the women were like it's not like he doesn't do anything right but i do so much more and the men are like what are you talking about i totally participate And they're like yeah you, you participate all right Um, And they, so they studied them and it turned out that the women were right. (laughs) And that women, even in relationships where the men really thought they were participating 50-50, it was more like 80-20. Right, right. Because I think that, and again, even if they're well-meaning men, there's this feeling that like, I've done the laundry and it's like, I've done you a favor versus just I've done the laundry. So now like I get some sort of extra credit for doing the laundry, whereas when you do it, it's just your job. So even if both people, That's right. are, and again, it could be even a well-meaning man, but there is just this perception that anything I do around the house is, I get some sort of extra credit for it because yes. really I shouldn't be doing it. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And you know what? Women have to be responsible. We have to get the word help out of our mouths. Yes. Hey, can you help me with the laundry? No, okay. no, 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 no. That implies it's your fucking job and it's yes. not. Or watch the children. No, no. Words can matter. You parent I'm... your children, please. Oh my gosh. You're, you're, you're going to get me going here. Okay. So uh-huh. this, I, this shit pisses me off to no end. Me this too. also, I get on my soapbox when I'm working with clients because I'm like, we need to somewhere, somehow stop this spousal support and he what what, i all the time have these conversations with women and they're like okay well he says he'll give me Uh -uh. you know four grand no 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 this is your money this This is is your your money money. even if you've been a stay-at-home mom for 10 years yes it is your money he's not giving you shit no when you sell the house he's not giving you half the proceeds no no, you are legally entitled to it Yes. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I get so upset that he's giving me, and I did it. I talked, I use those words all the time and attorneys use it all the time. And even when it's their old clients and they'll be like, okay, well, he's going to give you X amount uh-uh. a month for child support. He's going to give you, no, he's financially supporting his children, which is right. morally and legally his obligation. So That's he's right. not giving anybody anything. Oh, Amen, yeah. sister. Yeah. Boy, <laughs> and he's not helping you no. with the dishes. He's no. doing the dishes. No. He's cooking dinner. He's not doing you a favor by watching the kids so you can go to the grocery store. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Right, right. How many men do we know that on a Saturday morning, you know, get up and go play golf, Yeah. right? Or get up and go play tennis or whatever, while yeah. we're home with the kids and I have, I have a friend, a feminist, a, uh, a guy who is like, you know, claims to do really equal in, in the labor, domestic labor. And, you know, and he is far more than anyone else, but actually I talked to his wife about it a few years ago and she just laughed and she's like, give me a break. She's like, he thinks that because he notices that the coffee is out and he goes and buys coffee, that he is 
you know, an equal partner in domestic labor, but I'm the one who knows that the kids have a project due on Friday that's going to require poster board, which means that I have to go to the store to get the poster board and make sure the markers have ink in them. And, oh, we're also going to need glue for that and construction paper. And I know that's due Friday, so I'm going to have to get that by Wednesday and it's, and, you know, and it's Monday. And so I have to like figure out when am I going to go to Michael's, right? And she's like, he doesn't know yeah. that shit. He doesn't know any yeah. of that. And so this guy, I mean, I, again, a good friend of mine, I love him but every saturday he wakes up and he goes for like an eight hour bike ride mm. they have two children right both of them work yes that's just his like you know that's just what he does and yes. it's you know i asked my girlfriend once i was like does he okay with you she's like well i just wake up and he's gone and i'm like are, <laughs> yeah. are you okay, yeah. okay with that we're we're gonna slowly turn the tide some sometime i don't know where i'm just gonna well, hold out hope we, that we're going to but well, we are right it starts because, here it starts I mean, here it starts here because i'll tell you what when i was going through this nobody was having these conversations in 2008 2009 exactly, not that i Kate. was hearing yep. right yep and you know the one of the i think good things that social media and technology has given us is these platforms to talk about these things and be really vocal about them and and point them out you know and this is why they're all so mad yeah this oh. is why they're all, all so angry yeah yeah there's <laughs> definitely going to be what i you know i call it the tantrum there's going to be a tantrum um on a societal mm -hmm. level so you're absolutely oh, right there is there yeah. is are you kidding yeah. You know, yeah. there is a tantrum happening. Of yeah, course. there is. There is. You know, one other thing I wanted to ask you about your program, something you talk about, which mm -hmm. I know would have been so helpful for me when I was going through it, because sort of just the conditioning to sort of just stay quiet, like, you know, uh, keep your head down, do your thing, keep trying. You talk about needing to know how to have super hard conversations without crumbling under pressure. And that really intrigued mm -hmm, me. And mm -hmm. I wanted you to talk more about that because I think that would be an awesome skill to, to have had. It is an amazing skill. And so, you know, the hardest conversation probably that you'll ever have is having the conversation where you tell your spouse that, you, that you're that you done. Usually we say it that we're telling them that we want a divorce, right? And when I talk about this conversation, Conversation, I really talk about it um, in terms of like, this is not, this is not a conversation. It's actually a declaration. You're it. not asking permission. You will not get permission. You will not get understanding. There is no world in which, uh, certainly an abuser will say, oh gosh, honey, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize you were so unhappy. Okay. I guess, you know, I need, you know, <laughs> if you yeah. love someone, let them go. <laughs> right. Like that's not, there's no world in which that's happening. No. And so the, this conversation is the way that you have a difficult conversation, first of all, is to plan the shit out of it, oh, especially yes. if you are somebody who suffers from, you know, codependence or you just, like you have a hard time holding and owning your power in front of this person, yeah. which you've been trained to have difficulty doing for, you know, most of your life, uh, you know, or the last 10 years or whatever it is. Right. And so so you have to plan it within an, an inch of its life and you just have to know that holding the holding your narrative is the most important but right I love this. and so yes you're this conversation it, they're going to try and take the narrative because that's what they do and so your job throughout it is to hold your cl hold clear and not go down the rabbit hole i always talk about this and i don't know if this is a good metaphor at all but i say it like this anyway it's like the the narrative that you are creating is like a, a cardboard box right? You're building a box around you and you're okay. saying, here's the deal. I am unhappy and I have decided that it is time for this marriage to end. It's no longer working for me. And I have decided that uh, it's time to get a divorce. And then he is going to start shooting an arm out of the, bo the box, right? <laughs> okay. What are you going to do to, what are you doing to our children? What are we going to do about the house? How do you think we can afford that? You don't get to make a unilateral decision about our marriage. You don't, you can't do that. You know, you're wrong, right? All of these things, right? There's nothing wrong with our marriage. And your job is to just keep closing the box, right? Oh, I like that. I know that this, is, this isn't what you want. I understand you're having a hard time accepting this or understanding why this, this would be the case. However, 
I have made a decision and my decision is final. So you're just, you keep closing the lid of the box, their hand shoots out and you just close the lid. Once they start to have some kind of understanding that this is, that you're actually fucking serious, yeah. they're going to start asking questions. What are we going to do about this? What are we going to do about this? And your response is, we have a lot of really big decisions to make ahead of us. Today is not the day to make those decisions. I just want to make sure that you are clear that I have made a final decision. Oh my gosh. And I love and, all of it. you know, for most people, that is so like outside the bounds of anything they think that they can possibly do. And most people have tried to have this conversation seven or eight times. They have been told that their feelings are irrelevant, that they are wrong. Their wrong. feelings are wrong, right? Which, and if that's not a reason to be like, yeah, I'm doubling down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, I don't know, thank, right? Thank you for making yeah. my point for me. Okay. <laughs> exactly. But instead of saying, thank you for making my point for me, we go, oh, there's something I'm do. Oh, it is me. Okay. Let uh, There's something else I need to try. Yes. Right. I'm just a miserable person. Apparently I'm just a miserable person. I guess I need to go to therapy to find out why I'm such a miserable person. I have anxiety and depression. That's why I'm unhappy in my marriage. Or you have anxiety and depression because you are in an abusive marriage. Yep. Right? Let's like remove that before we figure out whether you actually have chronic anxiety and depression, which, you know, many of us do. And by the way, a lot of mine is from complex uh, PTSD, right? From my marriage and my upbringing that brought me to my marriage. Right. <laughs> right. Yep. So, so having these difficult conversations is really about, again, knowing yourself, creating your narrative, holding your narrative and constructing it so clearly for yourself that you don't allow the other person to take your narrative. Oh, and okay. I just love everything you said, because I remember the first time when I finally got a grasp on that myself in, in, in a situation, having a difficult mm -hmm. conversation with my ex. But the one thing I also try to drive home with clients as well as what you're saying is you need to get your story out. And we don't care if it's an arm that sticks out of the box, a leg that sticks out of the box. If you think about it, it's irrelevant. Where your anxiety mm -hmm. is coming from is you know they're going to try to drag you down so many different trails and deflect and get you um, That's right. uh, explaining yourself and explaining yourself and defending yourself and defending yourself. And you have to do your best to almost ignore what comes That's out of right. their mouth. 100%. It's, it's irrelevant what that comes out of their mouth because they're going to do their tantrum. They're going to do their two-year-old tantrum. They're going to beg and then they're going to whine and then they're going to plead. Then they're going to get angry and then they're going to do this and they're going to do that. And then they're going to start all over and do it again. You and have to not yeah. care and keep on your track of what your speech is. And then you need an exit strategy. I always say- And then say, you end it. That's right. Then you yes. end it. Yes. And also, by the way, tomorrow they're going to they're gonna do every home project that you've been asking them to do for the last 10 <laughs> yeah. years. They're going to be They're going to be the amazing. best <gasps> dad in the whole world. Yes. They're going to be so perfect. And then you're going to start doubting yourself. Yes. Yes. And within two weeks, they're going to revert back. If, if you if you say like, oh gosh, I don't know. Oh, I'm going to pretend the conversation never happened, right? They're yeah. just going to be perfect. And then if you continue on your path, as soon as they realize that this tactic isn't working, they're going to turn into a rage machine. Oh, it's going to piss them off. That's right. And, or you're going to go, oh, maybe I was, okay, well, maybe he can do it, right? Okay. He can change obviously. So maybe I should rethink this or give it some space, give it some time. And within two to three weeks, he'll be right back to who he was. Mm -hmm. And by the way, if he's turning into, you know, the superstar best guy in the whole wide world, what that tells you is he knew exactly what he should be doing all along. He just didn't fucking think he had to. My and job. that shows you how much respect he has for you. I love that you said that because it's like, we... Please don't buy it because really it's a fuck you almost that he's doing it. Is. It. it is. It is. It's it like, is. Are you my ex kidding? literally said to me, right. My ex literally said to me uh, two weeks after I was finally like, I'm done. Um, And he came to me and he said, I'm so sorry. I just never thought you'd leave. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's your apology? <laughs> your oh, apology. Wow. Your apology is I knew what I was doing. I just thought I could continue to get away with it because I never thought you would right. actually leave. Right. And, you know, uh -huh. just circling back to what we were saying before about how marriage is super awesome for men. Think about one, if, if you're in a, 
you know, relationship where there's like narcissistic abuse, they're losing the person they're controlling. Like, and this mm -hmm. is how they, this is, you're their oxygen. Their control their is their oxygen. That's right. Or their supply. That's right. So mm -hmm. one, they're like, what the fuck? I'm going to lose my oxygen, which is yeah. controlling you. B, marriage is super awesome for me. And now I don't have a maid. I don't have a slave. I don't have a servant. <laughs> you honestly think you're my servant. You think you're going to leave me? And so I love just helping them have the whole conversation because, man, do you have to plan for it, like you said, down you do. to the... You do. You have to plan for the conversation. You have to plan for the aftermath of the conversation, yeah. right? This isn't one and done. No. You know, they're going to ignore it and pretend it never happened and pretend to be great. And then a week later, you're going to have to say, hey, so I noticed that you've been doing all these things. I just want to make sure that you understand that my decision still stands. Yeah. Yeah. Which, you know, what's so interesting about that because one of the tactics is they get, they, they turn perfect and then they like to pretend like the conversation never happened. Right. And it they're hoping happened. you don't have the balls to bring it up again. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And so you have to be prepared that this is not a one and done and you are going to have to, you are going to have to repeat the conversation. Let me tell you something. This is a template. Like I'm saying all this and Jackie's like nodding her head. Like, yeah, exactly. This is exactly what they do. It's what they all do. All of them. It's a template. Every they, single one of them. They all follow the same script. It, it's. Yep, I always all, say. It's, it's unbelievable. There is a platform eight and three quarters somewhere and these guys get on and they go to the Hogwarts School of Narcissism and they all learn from the same curriculum and they come back and we've got to find it and blow it up because they're graduating way too many of them. <laughs> And because they all are learning. It's, it's so, so true. From opposite sides of the country, from two different families, have the same script. It's my same. Life. It's it, it really is. It, it It's so weird. I love that. I think you're right. There is an eight. <laughs> like, for me in three quarters <laughs> and they've all gone and learned it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and really what that what that Hogwarts school is, is patriarchy. You're right. That's what it is. They learn it. They, they are all learning from the same, yeah. uh, the same curriculum yeah. and it is our culture and what yeah. we're steeped in. So it's really not such a mystery. It's not that much of a mystery. The mystery is how the fuck do we break this thing down Yeah. when, yeah. you know, they're the ones in power and it serves all of them. Yeah. You know, and one so step at a time. Elect more women. Elect yep. more. And this is why, you know, look, I'm going to get on my soapbox for a minute. <laughs> this is why, you know, people are like, you shouldn't talk about politics in your business and in your work. And I'm like, you know what? If I don't, I'm irresponsible because I am about like, where does this shit start? Yeah. And so I just laid it out, right? We're talking about how do we stop these narcissists from, you know, from abusing us? W you know, what is the curriculum that they learn from? And the curriculum is the patriarchy. Yeah. And it, the patriarchy doesn't die because we have an overwhelming number of men in power in our country making the laws of our country. And let's not put like, let's not sugarcoat this. Women are dying at alarming rates because of it. Dying. Dying. They're being murdered yes. because of this. And so the only way we get this to change is by getting more women in power. So <laughs> this is why politics matters here. It does. You I'm sorry. You can't and I'm not sorry talk about it. You yeah. can't not. You can't not. I can't. I can't. I cannot not talk about that. Nope. You're absolutely right. I am. Um, I want you to tell us, Kate, also more about some of the other programs. I noticed like right now you have something um, that people can sign up for grit and <laughs> Grit and Grace. Grit yes. and Grace. Okay, that's so. Grit and Grace. Grit and Grace is my group coach, coaching program, um, and that is it's amazing. It's it's women coming together um, in a community and supporting um, each other and and themselves. And so we have three live calls every month, the first three um, Thursdays of the month, and we're on a call for two hours with me coaching you guys. Um, and it's intimate and it's, it's wonderful. And I love it. Um, I have guest experts come in and do, um, classes on various topics with them and, um, it's a great support. And then I also do private coaching. And then I also have my divorce survival program, which is an online program that really talks through like, you know, the logistics and how to get through your divorce yeah. <laughs> with a bunch of guests, uh, you know, special guests in there as well that are, you know, people who are, you know, attorneys and financial advisors and CDFAs and all of the, all of it. So awesome. Yeah, you need all of it. There's, 
no such thing as too much information, uh, you know, when you're going through something like this, it's just, it's so yeah. hard. And I'm so glad yeah. that you are out there on the front lines, helping women. Um, there need to be more of us. There can never be enough of us. And, you know, it's That's like right. you said, it all starts here with a conversation. And like you said, I'm so happy that we have platforms now like podcasts and you were way before me, even uh, you were 10 years before me in your divorce. And I just was oh, yeah. barely finding information. I, I feel like I was oh, just on the forefront mm -hmm. of information just coming out on everything from narcissistic abuse to just like post-separation abuse to these, you know, we call them high conflict divorces, but really it's one person causing all the problems. Um, Hello, it's called domestic violence. That's yeah. what it is. It's not yep. high conflict. No, it's Amen, flat out sister. domestic violence. Yep. Yep. So we need education both for ourselves and everyone else. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing all of that knowledge with us. Everyone go to kanthony.com. And also, again, her podcast, the Divorce Survi Survival Guide podcast, which, again, I'm, I'm sure you're already listening to it if you're here. <laughs> but if you're not, you need to be. If not, come on over. Yeah. Come on over. And she's right now got signups for Grit and Grace coaching program on her website. And, um, you know, should I stay or should I go? All of it. Thank you again, Kate. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Jackie. This is such a blast. I really, I really awesome. enjoyed talking awesome. to you. Thanks so much. Okay. Take care.